Hi, we're at Your Amigos Live 2023. Welcome to the GU Oncology Now Kidney Cancer Roundtable. My name is Brian Reedy. I'm a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I have a distinguished panel joining me today to talk about several different topics across advanced kidney cancer. And I'll let them each introduce themselves. Tian? Sure. Hi, I'm Tian Zhang, a geomedical oncologist at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Really pleased to join today. Hi, uh, my name is David McDermott. I come from Boston, Beth Israel Deaconess, where I'm chief of medical oncology. Glad to be here as well. And I'm Hans Hammers. I'm a medical oncologist at UT Southwestern, uh, kidney cancer focus. So thanks all for joining. We're going to talk about a lot of different uh, areas of kidney cancer. The first area we're going to focus on is frontline clear cell kidney cancer. We're going to talk about non-clear cell next. And I think let's just start with your general approach to the typical patient. So advanced clear cell patient, let's say they've already had a nephrectomy, let's take that out of the equation, uh, one IMDC risk factor, or no contraindications of meds, et cetera. So your, your run-of-the-mill typical RCC patient. Tian, why don't you start and just give us, what are you thinking about? What leans you one way or the other? What are the considerations? Sure. I, I mean, the immunotherapy doublets are, have obviously um, been our standard. And so when I approach that patient in clinic, it's often um, their symptom burden and also uh, the amount of d disease burden. Um, even in um, you know one IMDC risk, we have variations of that. So uh, the people who are not so symptomatic and have minimal um, burden of disease, I'm really thinking ipilimumab, nivolumab, IOIO doublets at this point. Um, if they have more symptomatic disease, need an earlier disease control, um, I'm thinking some of the VEGFIO combinations. And do you have a, we talk about symptomatic high volume disease. How do you define that? I mean, I know it's a, sorry, the eye of the beholder, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. Um, you know, is if they have um, particularly rapidly growing disease, um, that's causing a lot of pain, or um, maybe it's next to a critical structure, right, and um, next to a um, nerve ending in, uh, in the spine, or um, next to um, portahepatitis nodes pressing on the bile duct or something like that. Okay. Um, so those types of things I, I will think about. And what percent of patients in your clinic do you think fall into that symptomatic enough for category? Early disease control. Yeah, um, where that's important. Of all of the kidney cancer patients I see, I probably um, 20, 30 percent. Okay, so that's yeah. a pretty good, pretty good amount. Yeah. Okay, um, but otherwise you default to AP Nevo. Right. Okay, <clears throat> David. So I agree with much of <laughs> Tian's approach, not surprisingly. Um, in our clinic, we generally don't use IMDC criteria to pick therapy. Mm -hmm. It's certainly very helpful for prognostication and talking to patients about how serious their situation is. It's certainly been helpful to us to get a sense of what the real world experience is. But I think what most of the trials we've seen have showed is as a predictive tool, it's not great, particularly at long-term outcomes. Um, but I agree with Tian's approach, unless people are in dire straits, we are offering, offering, offering them PD-1 or PD-1 CTLA-4 as a first line approach based on their sort of risk tolerance, meaning we have a frank conversation with them about how adding CTLA-4 doubles the risk of toxicity, particularly severe toxicity, and if they're okay with that, taking that risk, um, we do the combo of Ipinevo. And you have the same approach of a, a bulky symptomatic patient or critical organs you might give IOTKI? Is that fair to say? Yeah. And how, how many, how do you, same questions, how do you define that and what percent is that? Uh, it's, well, it's not firmly defined. Right. I think if someone's in the hospital, for example, with, sure. with presenting, they'll get a TKI usually in the hospital and then, you know, outpatient IO therapy. If someone, if you get a sense that they might not be well enough to be treated in two or three months, they get an IO TKI. My percentages are maybe slightly lower than okay. TNs, but they're, pretty low. Most people get PD-1 first, knowing that they can get TKI as salvage, and many of them will need it. I think one of the problems we faced as a field early on, particularly when developing Ipinevo, is we didn't transition quickly enough to TKI. So if you look at Checkmate 214, there are a lot of early deaths in that trial, which are worrisome. And, you know, so we need to change our approach to be more aggressive about adding a about TKI itself. if you don't see an early response with and do you think maybe that was because it was sort of the pseudo progression and let's wait and maybe they'll respond and really they were just progressing and now we know a little better? Well, I think it's part of it. And I, <laughs> one of my biggest mistakes of my career was being partly responsible for that whole pseudo progression concept. 
Um, I think it happens. We, we see that sometimes in melanoma. I don't think we see it in other diseases. And yeah. particularly with patients with symptomatic worsening, you almost absolutely have to be changing right away. And we need to drill that into our... Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think sometimes some mediastinal nodes will increase, you know, but true pseudo progression and then response, I'm not sure. I've right. seen it maybe once or twice. Right. Most, though. And that's pro partly why that trial did what it did. I yeah. think also some toxicity issues with the combo, some people not transitioning over to Nevo maintenance if they didn't get all four right. doses. That's, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me about the Cosmic 313 experience is there they gave the Yepi Nevo more like we give it in clinic, and the results are better. Pretty good, yeah. Okay. So that's good. Hans, how do you approach patients? Yeah, actually very similar to David. I don't it'll be, uh, I, so I don't actually really care about the, the risk stats. Um, uh, I actually just asked the question, does the patient need a TKI right now or not? Okay. Uh, and that percentage in my clinic is less than 10%. Okay. Um, so it's really, you know, uh, symptomatic patients worried about uh, critical structures. Um, even if a patient has a pain somewhere, we can radiate that, we can do other things. So pain per se, uh, uh, if there's not a critical structure associated with it, I really mm -hmm. don't care about. Um, but then there are patients in the hospital. I just had a patient last week. I ran lenvatinib across the <laughs> across the hospital. Um, because she was on high doses of or, or, or high levels of oxygen, for example. Yeah. Um, and then coming back to what um, what David was saying, I think is absolutely correct. I, I think we actually, you know, there were constraints right on checkmate two one four, right? And there was the first of immunotherapy. Patients wanted to stay on it. You didn't want to pull them off too early, mm -hmm. et cetera. So. These days, if I get worried about some early progression or for some time that the patient needs to actually have the immune system get control of the cancer, I may fly in a TKI early. In fact, I just add it to the, to the doublet uh, if I have to. Um, and so, so uh, I, I, think, I think nowadays we can be much more, um, you know, um, uh, um, selective in how we actually approach this problem. But yeah, so, so, so I think most patients don't need a TKI, the vast majority, um, and then I focus on IOIO. Okay. Um, just for balance, I, I tend to be more of an IOTKI user, right? So I believe in Ipinevo, certainly for sarcomatoid, I think the data is great. All the regimens have sarcomatoid data, but Ipinevo is the most mature by far, and also central pathology oh. review, I just think it's better data. Um, you know, young, healthy patients. I tend to be an IOTKI user, I tend to use Lenpembro, but that lenvatinib is troubling in terms of toxicity, as you all well know, certainly at 20 milligrams. Um, and then I tend to use Axipembro if I'm worried about a patient's frailty. I think to answer my own question about how many patients have bulky symptomatic disease, I think it's probably 10% or less, I think, somewhere in there. And again, there's, there's, it's very gray. Like, we would all probably define it differently. You kind of know it when you see it. It's one of those things, but we all define it differently.